We are down to just 32 players remaining here for WCS Montreal as we have concluded group stage two. And now we move on to group stage number three here for Montreal. And once again, everything is so important from this point onwards as a lot of these players hope to try and get to BlizzCon or solidify themselves that spot if they are in the current top eight. To my left-hand side, joined by Zombie Group and Rotterdam to start things off here in group stage three. And Zombie Group, Already, we've had some surprises here that I don't think that many people were expecting. Uh, certainly not. When I heard that he lost to DNS, special that is, mm. I was like, okay, well, DNS is an up-and-coming European. Yeah. Protoss, all right then. But we kind of know Zanster a little bit more. We know his track record a little bit more. And it was just not expected. TVZ is also usually really nice for special. And it was a 2-0. Blow my mind. Yeah, very impressive stuff for them. Yeah, Zanser looked great. Haven't seen that Zanser in quite some time. Even though he's been around, he's been attending some of these tournaments, yep. and you always know that he's someone that you have to consider that could potentially go far. He doesn't do it that often. That was just an awesome performance. And, you know, it's really funny, because before that series, I was looking at the results, and I was like, actually, not that many upsets yet. You know, mm. if you ask me right now, I don't really see that many upsets. Then suddenly, Pili also took out Drogo in their Decidus match, and that, to me, is a pretty big upset as well, because Drogo, to me, was one of these wild cards that could potentially make Maybe even make a semi-finals, you know, if the bracket would line up nicely for him. We saw how good he was in Valencia. Yeah, I'm shocked. Yeah, it's uh, been a crazy tournament already uh, as we had our group stage to conclude. Of course, a big thank you to our sponsor in Asus, who joins us here for WCS Montreal, moving forwards to find out who is going to be moving on to BlizzCon. Now, we have 32 players remaining. We move into group stage number three here, and our first match is going to be Scarlet going up against Puck and Zombie Grub. These are two players that are very familiar with one another. Yes, they are. Of course, part of the NA scene, playing a lot in those NA tournaments, Kings of the North and stuff like that and well I mean Puck is familiar with Scarlet Zerg. True. But who knows how familiar he is with her Protoss. That's a very good point that you do bring up. So Scarlet has come into this tournament under the flag of Protoss initially mm -hmm. but she does have the opportunity before a series begins if she wants to to go back to Zerg or um, what have you. So there's that question mark in the air, Rotterdam, as to what she's going to be playing in the upcoming series. Yeah, the biggest problem is that there is a bunch of, uh, well, there are two Zergs in this group, so maybe mm. we'll see some of her PVZ, which we just know is incredibly good, but it's hard for us to predict. I mean, obviously, it's useless to speculate because we just don't know yet. She hasn't told us. Yeah. These are the groups, by the way, and I think this is very important to mention. These are the groups for Group Stage 3. Mm -hmm. They were not announced before yet. This is also where the seeded players come in from WCS Challenger. I was going over the groups already a little bit. I don't really have a particular group of death. Yeah. I do really like Group G, actually, which is the group that we're going to be casting first game of, because it also has Cham, who's obviously one of the players we have to keep an eye on, because he's yep. currently quite close to the top eight. And then I also think the group of True is quite interesting, uh, which is, like, I just had it. And, oh, yes, Group F, actually, which has Haas, who's, I mean, I know you love Haas. He's obviously the underdog in that group. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I hate to break it to you guys, but he's not supposed to make it out of that group. But it does have TLO, who finally doesn't have Nip. Heep, heep, hooray, you know, good job, Dario. <laughs> he won his group before, a very impressive yeah. performance by him so far. And we've got Zens, who looks really good. So Zen stayed True and TLO. That is not an easy group for True. And True, once again, desperately needs points. Yeah, just sitting on the cusp there of that eighth spot. Uh, we can talk about Scarlet and Puck in a bit more detail in just a few moments' time, but Mal is indeed ready now to head over to the stage. So, James, we've got a good series on our hands. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And this is one matchup that I was really, 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 really waiting for. <laughs> the next one up is one I think we all at the venue can get wild for, right? It's the battle between the old friends, familiar faces, battle between the old timers, the battle between the North American representatives. Now, if you have come up north to join this event from the States, give it up for your homeboy, Puck. Now, Canada, rise for Scarlet! This is where things get serious now in Group Stage 3. Points are on the line, and we're talking about BlizzCon once again. For Scarlet, a win is the most important thing here for her hopes if she wants to get to BlizzCon. 
Guys, it's going to be incredibly hard, obviously. It's not the most unlikely thing ever to happen. We know that he's absolutely capable of having a magical run here yeah. and somehow winning yeah. the tournament. But I don't think he's the first pick for many. He's like right below that. But I think if you ask most people who are the favorites, a lot of people say Showtime and Neep, I think, mm. are the two. And then obviously you've got Cyril. And I think right after that, you had players like Special, but also Scarlet. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Cyril as well. But right, like. Last year in Montreal was where I think that was the first time that the Scarlet fans were like, oh, oh she's back, like, she's defeating Nurchio, like, yeah. oh my god, what are you going to do? Wasn't able to actually take it too far, like a hometown hero, Canada, I suppose, in Montreal, <laughs> but maybe, maybe this time, maybe the, the, the swapping of the races would be great, I don't know, but uh, it is hometown hero. So. I think it's an all right group for her, though, and once again, <laughs> it has Cham, and it also has Lambo, and I do think that Lambo is important to single out here, because Lambo is one of the most underrated players, I think, in the entire circuit. Mm -hmm. He's just been getting a little bit unlucky in some of those events and obviously you can't just all blame it on luck it's all to, up to him as well he has to perform and it matters the most right. but Lambo is super super legit and I think Lambo is actually the favorite to make it out of this group together with Scarlet but Puck is you know Puck is Puck every now and then he just plays some fantastic Starcraft and we're like all right can you do that again and then suddenly the next tournament he can do it again right. well, but yeah. uh yeah it's a hard group it's it's a tough one but i think it's a doable one for scarlet i think it's it's more than doable actually i think that she takes on puck most of the time actually i find it really hard to think about when the last time she pro he probably took a series off of her mm. but and then her zvz was something that even the koreans were scared of over in korea so assuming that she plays zvz i think this is actually something that she could even get first if she's really informed well, it looks like a Zerg logo there to start off this PVZ. Does it mean Question anything? Mark? <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, I do think <laughs> this is going to be a ZVP. I think Scarlet is pretty damn good in ZVP at the moment. And, you know, playing Protoss versus the Zergs, he thinks he can beat. So to avoid some ZVZ or maybe just not reveal anything, I can absolutely see happen in this tournament. But playing a PVP against Puck, yeah. I think that would just be madness. But then again, he played PVT against Semper in Challenger <laughs> and he won, so... <laughs> So uh, what, are you, what are we thinking about Puck's prospects in this tournament? Aside from, you know, he's, he's a lot further down in the points, not exactly in the position where he can challenge. It would need to be a tournament victory for Puck here in Montreal, but that's very difficult, one would say. Fair to say? That, that is very fair to say. That would be very <laughs> difficult to do. I mean, hopefully his PVZ is pretty good, because that seems to be what his group is going to be, and that's yeah. the first step on to bigger and better things. But I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I think that he's taken a lot of hiatuses from StarCraft over mm. the years, you know, been more streamer than player, and it's just, uh, I'm glad to see him here, of course, yeah, but I'm yeah. not sure he's going to be able to make it out of even this group. Yeah, Puck, his career is a little bit of a roller coaster. Sometimes he does have really high ops. I think the highlight was still the Gold Series in Shanghai 2016, where he made it out of an impossible group back then. Mm. I know that Marine Lord had snoot. He made it to the semifinals. Had a very close series against Harstam back then. That's still by far and away the best performance out of his career. Since then, it's been up and down. But even two, three weeks ago, I saw his Twitter. He's like, guys, I'm so excited for Montreal. I'm really feeling it. I'm really going to do my best to grind a lot of games. And I just really want to have a good run. So far, it's been pretty good. I mean, making it to the round of 32, securing prize money is good. He beat Sword of in the second group stage. We didn't see the games. But beating Sword of is also very legit because we know what yeah. Kenix Bergman is capable of. So <laughs> Fox seems to be in all right shape. So what, how does Scala approach, I, I suppose, not only this match, but also this tournament? Because it's fair to say she needs pretty much a tournament victory. How does she approach people like Puck and then the upcoming stages? It's actually a very difficult question. I'm really not sure where her mindset is in general, to be honest. Like, I'm pretty good friends with her, but, yeah. you know, switching over to Protoss, like how much invested, like 50-50 time between two races is very difficult to do. So, like, is she just like, is that maybe her being more relaxed because she's like, oh, I'm not expecting a lot from myself from either race and it's just, you know, have some fun in my tournament or is this even more stress because she really, really, really wants to get to BlizzCon? Mm. Uh, I don't think she's that focused right now on the global finals. I think then you're just getting too far ahead of yourself. I honestly think you have to take it one stage at a mm. time. You know, if you can make it past this group, which yeah. is not easy, but definitely doable, then let's see how the bracket shapes up and then you can always start dreaming, right? But right mm. now, it would be incredibly silly to overlook a group that has Puck, that has Cham, who's had a fantastic year so far by far the best of his career mm -hmm. and then also Lambo who in my opinion is probably the most underrated player in this tournament and also when it comes to his performance so far he just hasn't played up to his level so I don't think that Scarlet should be worried about the global finals and winning this entire thing let's take it one one day at a time and it, let's at least make it to tomorrow and then we can start dreaming do you think that Scarlet's critical analysis of how the other WCS spots have gone has kind of aided her because we saw her play Protoss in the challenges, but in the last two or 
in two of the WCS circuit events, she did lose out in Zerg versus Zerg. So do you think the switch to Protoss versus Zerg to avoid those ZVZ round of 16s? Because against Zerg seems like the most important matchup in some of these circuit events. I mean, that's a very important thing to bring up, because I know the first one that she was in uh, two WCS events ago, I think it was off uh, different servers. So she didn't want to play ZVZ because she True was in Korea. True yeah. Yes, yeah. but I think the last one she was actually in Canada, so right. there's really no excuse anymore. So is her ZVZ actually you know, really feeling the burn from also practicing Protoss? Yeah, and, uh, well, once again, I think her Protoss is excellent. And I've said it before, and I think yeah. I underrated her Protoss a tiny bit in the past, and she also likes to tease me about it, how like sometimes <laughs> I'm wrong about like her Protoss skills. And she said certain birds are unbeatable, and so far she had a flawless record with it. But as much as I like respect a player like Panna BME, who I really think is an excellent Zerk in the North American scene, yeah. she beats Panna BME pretty handily and even Jig, I find it very impressive, but those guys are not Lambo, you know? Like, Lambo is really okay. a higher level, so mm -hmm. if he would end up, let's say, in the winner's match here against Lambo, I don't know if playing PvZ would be the smartest thing to do, but maybe I will look silly again as he actually does <laughs> do it and somehow takes the group, so we'll see. Uh, predictions are predictions. It's always nice to speculate. All right, thank you very much. As we now head over to our commentary team, as Scarlet goes up against Puck here at WCS Montreal. G'day Montreal, Maynard and In Control here to bring you one of the sickest series that we could bring you in the early stages of this tournament. Scarlet, the hometown hero against Puck, one of the NA's biggest long-term veterans here. It's a classic clash if you watch that North American scene, but I think here in WCS is a bit interesting. This is a good run from Puck so far. But Scarlet, of course, is the one that does have that ability to perhaps make a deep enough run and win this darn thing. That's right. And in the bottom right here, playing as Protoss, this is Root Gaming's Puck! And the top left, choosing Zerg! This is Team Expert Scarlet! A lot of fans for her out there in the crowd, no surprises here. But Puck has been saying that he is feeling very good about his StarCraft these days. Yeah, it's always nice playing in front of a, a friendly audience, but I don't think Puck's going to be too put off or intimidated by that. He's probably very used to having people kind of count him down and, and, and uh, just count him as the underdog, as someone that they're not necessarily here for. He's not the marquee player, but he has been putting in a lot of work. I liked what they were talking about at that desk, that Puck has been a streamer and a competitor for a long time, but when he really decides to kind of put it on and, and, and compete and, and dive in that direction, he is capable of making deep runs and beating very good players. So Scarlet has her hands full here. Uh, yeah, I would not say that Scarlet's got a easy victory here to say the least for sure. I mean, Puck, uh, historically for me, Puck's PVZ has been like one of his strongest matchups. Yeah. And he's just done so well. He understands the matchup at a, at a much higher level than most people in any. But he, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really comes down to how much StarCraft is, Star is Scarlet playing, because she is a little bit of an enigma sometimes, mm -hmm. as to, you know, what her practice is looking like uh, back at home. But Puck, being the streamer, being, being a little bit more active in the social media, it's a little bit easier to see that he is very active in a very good spot mentally right now. Good spot indeed. Uh, Puck is a tough opponent in that he is someone that has like his styles that he really likes, and of course he's got his builds that he'll go to as well. But those builds and those styles can end up being a little bit more free play than a lot of other players are. A lot of players go into a tournament like this and say, well, in this matchup, here's the two, maybe three things I do. A lot of them will even say the one thing I do. Mm. Um, and then it's just about execution. It's about mechanics. Puck has excellent execution in mechanics, but is uh, very much so willing to be like, huh, oh, that base is a little bit different from what I was planning. Maybe I'll do a cheeky cannon rush. I'll do a proxy here and there. Like, he's a little bit more free form which is good and bad for your opponent. Your opponent can sometimes capitalize on impromptu mistakes, but can also fall victim to not really understanding exactly what's happening because you're less predictable. Yeah, that's right. And he actually does sometimes. I mean, we're seeing a pretty meta build here from Puck just going for the Stargate, like a, a pretty regular opening here. Uh, dropping a pile on here to try and block that third hatchery. We'll delay it up slightly more here for Scarlet. Um, not too much of a delay, though. He will be able to burn that pile on down eventually. But it's, you know, Puck is the kind of guy that's been flying that disruptor flag still in PvZ. Like, yeah. it's, it's something that you don't really see from a lot of top Protosses anymore. But Puck is really renowned, like, like M. Canning, like and another American Protoss I can think of, for <laughs> disruptor play against it. The legend himself, yes. Probably not quite as good as the literal son of a disruptor, but... Uh, oh. 
is way, way up there. We had our Observer, unfortunately, drop from the game. Yeah, we need that guy. Can we go into the laptop, perhaps? Because we have the game. Yeah, we'll we have to see game. here. Otherwise, we're going to get this extremely unattractive blue tint shot here of Puck. Um, <laughs> something is not agreeing there, I'll tell you what. But and like Scarlet's rocking the red, by the way, which is... Yeah, matches a hairstyle. Maybe Puck's Complexion. color is red as well, but only one, you know. Yeah. He's kind of... Is kind of looking like the Dark Lord from Harry Potter at the moment. He's play yeah, he's playing the role. Um, well, we're gonna have to kind of figure this out, guys. We have not heard word just yet, and the game is continuing yeah, on. It's still going, we can, uh, we I mean, we can do a radio broadcast, and you can just see the the thumping fingers of these two players and the tight jaw of Scarlet here as she mouths her tongue down. And now we're gonna go ahead and pause and try to figure out what happened. I was about to ask, how is your 1950s broadcast radio? Uh, that oh, would be very good. I, I guess we're going to pause, guys, and get back into that game. So that's the beautiful thing of StarCraft is we actually have the ability to be like, okay, well, something happened. Well, we'll just go ahead and pause and resume from that moment in time. So we're going to do that right now. Um, it looks like a like maybe a, a crash or something for the Observer there, but, I mean, good patch back in Heart of the Swarm. We got that resume from replay. Look at that it's shot, man. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, this will not show up at his wedding. Like, they, they will not... <laughs> <laughs> when they're like great moments of Puck and they, this picture won't make it. Scarlet on the other hand. You don't like, think it's going to replace his uh, Liquipedia photo on social media? No. Probably, gosh. probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Hopefully you guys are having a good time. We've got three days of great StarCraft coming up. It is, uh, it's really heating up. If you look at these groups, they're pretty tight. There are no... I, I liked what they were talking about at that desk again. There's not really a group of death. The talent is kind of spread up between all the groups. There's, of course, equal opportunity for uh, a lot of these players to go ahead and plow through those groups and, and make yeah, it out. Yeah. And now we're seeing the players, too, by the way, that um, qualified. And here it is. I love this. Yeah, good uh, pick up there from production. So we're seeing all the groups sort of fly up. Wow, Cham us. already won. Look, I, you know what? Here, can we just take a moment? Kevin spent 35 of the 40 minutes at that desk talking about Lambo. <laughs> Ran into Cham, and Cham has been the WCS nemesis. This guy is getting those results, and a lot of it's been ZVZ. He's done a very good job. Yeah. Of what it's the the Cham Snoot ZVZ of I think it was Valencia. For all you guys out there that that check vods and, and watch that stuff, that was one of my favorite ZVZs I've seen I think ever in a very long time. Some uh, tough groups for uh, you know being one of the very ah! few Australians. <laughs> in this tournament as a commentator. It's pretty tough groups for the Aussies as well in, uh, in uh, yeah. Seether and Probe getting through the Challenger back from where Is this Seether's first uh, WCS? Uh, no, he qualified for Yonshiping, but I remember didn't it well. win a map, unfortunately. Okay, well. You remember it well, yeah. Time to do uh, better than that. You can Probe, however, has been, uh, been killing it on stage. Yeah. He had a very nail-biting series against uh, Neeb, multiple-time WCS champion. Uh-huh. Took him to the distance. It was 2-3, I think, that he lost. And even then, he was ahead in that series. Yeah, could have easily gone either way. Uh, mm -hmm. Guys, next game is, uh, well, I guess game one. Look is at the blue tint away. on them. You guys rock the blue tint, by the way. You good guys job. look good in blue. You look good in blue. You yeah, you throw those horns up. You feel good about that. Lord you, Voldemort on stage, though. So. Well, it's a different kind of rock. You know, he's, yeah. someone's got to play the villain. True. We're almost back into this thing. Um, hopefully, you guys, like I said, are having fun. Tomorrow is the long day. A lot of StarCraft tomorrow. But for these players, this is the weekend. They, BlizzCon is a life-changing event. For a lot of them, it is absolutely the career-defining moment. I mean, think about a laser last year, making that deep run. It's something we'll talk about for the, the rest of the StarCraft II lifespan. And uh, for, for, for a lot of players here, this is the weekend that determines whether or not they get to be a part of that. It's yes, huge. this it's is the last, last chance to get on that platform and catch that BlizzCon train. Like, it's, yeah. it's about to pass forever for 2017. And it's starting to shape up. You've delayed the inevitable, Scarlet. <laughs> you shan't escape me again. Oh, fuck, okay, Dunbar. Is that... I've watched, you're I've doing the Harry Potter thing. Yes. Look, I, right. I just, it just screams Lord Voldemort to me. I'm I sorry. think that just came out in Australia, right? So how are you guys yeah, like We that just got the Philosopher's Stone, as That's well nice. as the, the new... Uh, have you heard of Ricky Martin? He just hit our shores. Ricky Martin. Ricky Martin just brought out this song called... There uh, is so much for you to learn. Yeah, no, he's, he's really good. We're really enjoying these brand new yeah. songs coming from America. You guys make some good stuff, by the way. Like, Well, we try. Uh, we didn't make Ricky Martin, though, as far as I know. Uh, I think that was, a, that was a Southern American. He is a Latin American man. He is indeed. That one. But, you know... I guess we can claim that as well. Hey, give a wave. That's fine. We can see you. 
Yeah. See, the blue tint for the audience. Is there a red tint for the audience? I don't know that there is. Mm. What's with this blue bias? Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see I, if, it's a, if the blue helps out Puck here. It is rocking the blue so hard there on stage. About one more minute, guys. Uh, yep. It's just enough time for you to get some poutine or uh, cafe. Some bomb cafe. Don't have some, some bad. Bomb cafe there. Yeah, what up, Thank Cyan? <laughs> That's the man, by the way. Guy runs interviews on, on the... He's one of the best guys in the community for running interviews and putting out content there on the YouTube. Look for him! And just a bunch of passion lords in the crowd all over the place here in Montreal. Crowd's starting to get a bit bigger as the time goes on, as it tends to do. We only have a, we have a handful of bestest reads today, but tomorrow is going to be, as you've said, the long one. Wow. Yeah, Dreamhack shirts, passion all over the place. Almost there, guys. Thank you for your patience, as always. We want to make sure that we get into that game and actually are able to commentate it. Mal, oh, wow, Mal, get Mal off the is working dude. very hard in the back corner there. It's oh. his mom! Hey, hey, hey! Well, that's not fair. That could be his girlfriend. <laughs> I'm never ready for you in control. No? Every time we cast together, I'm like, this is going to be really fun, but I hope I don't start crying while trying yeah. to commentate it. I mean, I'd, I, I, if I had a dime for every time I heard that. I try, I try. Couple of handsome blokes. And now it's, that's, a, that's actually a beard I'm envious of. And actually, on the left, hair that I'm envious of. We can combine the two together. Yeah, very nice. I'm very, very happy with my looks there. Oh, someone is too kawaii for the camera here, trying to trying to hide himself, but... Uh, understandable. Understandable, yeah, he's a little bit too good looking for the camera. Oh, wow. Actually putting a lot of us at risk here. Yeah. Trying to think of jokes, but everyone just looks so yeah. handsome and like nice Like, we can't actually friendly. pick on anyone no, because I everyone looks so good. That's the need problem. to find someone in the audience that I can make fun of, but yeah, everyone is just so keep, darn let's, awesome. Let, let's just keep scanning. Let's just keep scanning. By the way, uh, as kind of a nice nod to yeah. everyone... <laughs> That's not funny, camera person. Um, everyone that's traveled into Montreal, it's been really nice. They've all been saying uh, that Montrealians or, or, you know... Montrealians? French lights, I think they're called, is actually the, the term, but they're very friendly. Everyone's talking about how friendly the city is, how beautiful it is. It's been really nice, so good on you, Montreal. It's been a really nice day. I know that for those of you on stream, you can't see that. You'll just have to take my word for it. But it's been very lovely to make these stops. And that's been part of what's so cool about WCS2 is seeing these different parts of the world. I really enjoyed Young Shipping, as always, Valencia. And it looks like we're about to get into the game. And here we are, finally, some StarCraft. That's right, we're back. Scarlet vs. Puck, game one, continuing here. Sorry about having to fill a bit of time there, guys. We did see some of the play come through, so we missed a little bit of the action. But as we can see, a couple of deaths shading into the natural uh, uh, oracle here of Puck, looking for drone kills in the main. This is your Reaper in a TVZ. This has become a bit of a song and dance. If it gets a drone or two, that's completely acceptable for both. And then it just kind of pulls back. And it's also very normal for a second Oracle to show up as well. Now, what has become a bit more of a normal part of the meta and a nuisance to our Zerg players is, do they not stop after two Oracles? We're seeing something like three or four Stargates in a lot of Oracles. And it was something that was almost like a joke coming out of Haas. It was one of those weird pocket strategies, but it's become the norm. Now, as we can see here with Puck, he is gonna go away from that. We're not seeing the additional Stargates just yet. He is stopping at the two Oracles, and that's part of what's given Protoss the strength of this matchup right now, is it's the Zerg that's not sure of what they're facing, and they have to really mix it up. So we're seeing like speed overlords or speed links, but they got to figure it out. Yeah, there is better shifts happening right now in StarCraft 2. Like, you know, the Hydra is hitting ZVT, Mass Oracle hitting PVZ, and then we're seeing like a race sort of on the back foot ha has to play differently to react to that. Um, and some Zergs don't have the answer for the Mass Oracle strategy. It's hit Korea, has hit European ladder, and all the ladders actually, North America as well. But um, just a couple of Oracles here, pretty strong when married up with the Adept as well. This is something that we saw a lot in the earlier WCS seasons. Yeah. Just a couple of Oracles with a few gateway units, but Charge has sort of been hitting the meta more than Adept Glaives lately. Yep, and Scarlet, as we saw there, oh. I mean, it's, it's a nice little victory that the probe did go down to the single Zergling, but one of the things that really defines some of our absolute top tier Zerg players, like a Scarlet, like an Elazer, Nurchio, Snoot, uh, is they're very consistent about getting information either through Lings, Overlords, or all the above, and staying on top of what they're facing. Now, what's good for them too is that the backdrop of this is they're going to go Hydraling Baneling. That's that's going to be something they're going to do pretty much regardless Ooh. of what they face. That's but the adjustments after that is is what they want to know about. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. We just saw on screen there a big a big catch there of those drones. No reaction from Scarlet. Stays towards a bunch of those. And also double robotics facility from Puck. He's got yeah. another one on the way while getting a prism from the first one. Yeah, it's almost an older style. I think this this should end up being immortal charge light archon, eventually storm, and then kind of, Neeb kind of popularized this last year. You then go into kind of like sky toss. And this is a big map for that. If you look top left, bottom right. A lot of bases just outside the perimeter of the first three. This is one of your big macro maps. Also fairly difficult to attack. There are wide open spaces, but you usually have to go up a ramp or through kind of a choke area. It's a very oh. defensible map as well. That patch, though, charge of Void Ray, not fast enough to get away from those Hydras. And you called it. We got ourselves a Templar Archives dropped here for that splash damage and also for Archons. A very, very meaty ball of Protoss about to be joining the field here yeah. for Puck. It's very, very tough to deal with, with, you know, the Banelings and that sort of thing, and Ling Bane Hydra, which of course is popular in ZDP and ZBT now. Yeah, but the War Prison plays an incredibly important role yes. right here. If it gets picked off, that's going to super empower uh, Scarlet to try and hit a timing attack well before Storm ever takes shape. But if Puck can buy enough time through the combined forces of the Oracle and this War Prism, usually you can have Storm by about the time that Hydra Ling Baneling time, timing attack occurs. And that's going to be the stress of this matchup, because if the Protoss can get to four bases, that's really rough Ooh. this earth. Big warp into charge lots here for Puck. He's going straight for the mineral line of the third hatchery. Scarlet is reacting. Her army is actually out of position here, right in the middle of the map. So yeah. these zealots are going to get a lot done. Yeah, they're getting a lot done. And the actually kind of subtle and cool thing about this is it wasn't a 30 zealot warp in, which will all die. This is actually a fairly inexpensive one, which allows for this. So up, up in the main base, some more damage will occur. It should just be mostly drones. If Scarlet doesn't pull these out, it's going to be a lot of drones. So some do die here. But wow. meanwhile, behind this, and this is something you talked about, Maynard, Storm is starting to finish. The double Robo Immortal, that's the actual teeth of this army. Zealots are just to buy time and create buffer, and Puck is pulling it off quite nicely. Now you look, Scarlet's got a head in supply, but if, the, if we're looking at six, eight, ten Immortals, five or six Templar with Storm, good luck getting through that. Yeah, GLHF trying to deal with that army without something scary and tier three. And what do you even make, man? He's got a guy that has Stargate already. You kind of have to go down the Broodlord path or something like that to deal with it. And that is just way, way, way ahead in this game. We're getting very far ahead of ourselves. The oh. Prism is still alive, by the way. The entire oh. mineral line where the saturation went down and Puck pulls it out of Helm's way. Yeah, here we go. And to your point, here comes Scarlet into this attack. And it's going to be a really uncomfortable decision where she's like, well, hey, I've got a good economy. I've got my composition. But if you already have Storm and Immortals, Unless Puck makes a mistake, which, well, Could he's going to head up over here. It, the most of course, is going to swing around. The angle's a bit rough. Those are drop -a lords They don't have anything in it yet. But Bailing's on top of the army. That's one of the ways to get on top of this. Absolutely. He'll be looking for, or she'll be looking for, rather, the big High Templar and the Sentry Ball here of Puck if he pulls oh, things Puck's up. Puck's out of position. Oh, the natural is in a lot of trouble here. Yeah, the Mother's not down. here either. He Okay. Oh, one Matt, storm. storm. That's actually Scarlet huge. Scarlet pulled Whoa. out. Oh, my goodness. And here we go. The Overs are going to try to jump on top of this army. The soft underbelly of the Templar and sentries are trying to pull back. Oh, Good spread from Puck, though. He's able to weather the storm uh, fairly well. And all of a sudden, Scarlet's army is these very weakened Hydras. The supplies are starting to close up here. Not bad. Now, one of the things that did happen, there's a lot of gas units did die for Puck, rebuilding them tough. But with that fourth base, Maynard, it becomes much more doable. You're absolutely right. Uh, Prism coming in here. A storm drop here on the drone line. Only five going down. That could have been way worse. A quick reaction there from Scarlet. Instead of losing all of her drones, she yeah. loses five. Still, damage is done. We have Puck ahead on workers now. 73 Provost, 73 Provost, the six, oh, seven. Get Prism it. is alive. Come on. Oh, that is that is tilting for the Zerg here. Oh, uh, that's rough. And if that goes down, by the way, again, like we kind of talked about, that becomes a huge issue for them. Double Scarlet. And we are going to, that's it. I mean, you can see the frustration even with the production crew. And that war prison didn't die. They just, they saw nothing but black. Now Scarlet's going to reload on this army. And to your point, there is that infestation pit. So there is a plan B for Scarlet. She's taking another base as well. But this Protoss army is getting disgusting. It's going to be very hard to fight into that. Yeah, Stalker's been thrown in the mix as well to help out. That's... This is, kind of, this is kind of the point of the game where Scarlet needs that next step, like the, the Infestation Pit's gone down. She needs to get something done oh. with Van Hydra before it goes down. Oh, Storm here in the Hydras! Offensive Storm, yeah. A couple of Storms do go down. Again, not a lot of Hydras themselves die, but they're so weakened, and they do not heal that fast. These are not Mutalists. So Scarlet still just kind of tunnel vision here a little bit. She's going to load up for a drop. I like this move. If you can get the Protoss out of position, they'll start to make mistakes, like the Templar will wander forward. They'll miss Force Fields. 
Uh, those storms, pretty darn good again. Look how weakened that army is. Yeah, it is, but I think the big punch here is definitely in these overlords. It's a Hydralisk overloaded overlords, by the way, so they are looking to kill a lot uh -oh. of probes, maybe even go on Scarlet the production Max. of, of she, probe. The counter is going to do oh. a lot of damage. She can't make units. That's right, and Puck's, Puck's actually pressing the issue here. She's pulled all the way back. He's on the creep, and he's marching right into the throat of Scarlet here. He has some charge loss leading the charge there on the third base. Meanwhile, the Hydras of Scarlet are in the main. Yep, and they can oh, get the there's a Templar. He comes in and it drops another storm. These units have seen better days. Meanwhile, Puck pushing up into that fourth base. Scarlet is going to try to swing around here, but her own buildings making this potentially so bad for those storms. They're not yet coming. Puck being very patient. Now swinging into position, there's the first storm, and Scarlet rakes herself over and over and over again. Another uh, storm goes down. This position's so critical. She has to fight the hatchery. It's out of here. And all of a sudden, Puck is on top of this base. Can't lose the army, though. Another storm here as well. And his units are starting to dry up. He does kill the base, but loses the army. Wow, yeah, and that's just massive damage on both fronts. Yes, losing the hatchery really sucks, but there goes the army of Puck. Now, yeah. Scarlet's in a position where she could potentially counterattack and do some counter damage, and it could be pretty big as well. Puck's got a big bank. I'm kind of wondering what's going on here with that production. He's going to throw down some more stasis force, try to hold on to this fifth base. And again, it becomes that issue of can he hold on to these bases? Because if he can defend, he will probably go on to win here. There's a Templar right up at the front lines. Oh. The storm does. Just kind of coat those Hydras. Drop shows back up over here. But those are pylons, and the pylons have a say. <laughs> uh, four Hydras loaded Overlord taken out by the Overcharge there. Enjoy your Overcharge while you still can. We have a Spire halfway done here yeah. for Scarlet. So she's looking for Broodlord tech. No surprises there. It'll do very, very well against Puck's army. But we can see the effect of losing that base, though. Scarlet's yes. having a tough time keeping up. She was down in supply for a few moments there. Now she's just barely above it. And as you pointed out earlier, the worker count was rough, but she has rebuilt it. 80 workers is quite a few. So she's trying to get that economy back up, but she's sitting on an army that's becoming more and more outdated as time goes on. That being said, though, Puck losing the army over at that fourth has given Scarlet enough time to perhaps get that Spire to a greater Spire and perhaps get some of those tier three units out here that could get her army back up on top. Yeah, being given the space to get the Broodlords could absolutely swing things in Scarlet's favor. Yeah. Right now, Puck is still making an army that's very anti Ling Bane Hydra. He's still making double immortals here. Right. He's still getting the upgrades for his Archons. And yes, Archons shoot up technically, but they're not amazing against Broodlords. We see that Greatest Spire right. now being more for Scarlet. Yeah, they're not super ideal. By, by about now, you would want to have several Stargates making things like Tempest or Carriers. But because he had to kind of rebuild that entire army, that's actually not something that's taking shape. And Manu, you make a really good point. I mean, he could add Stalkers, I guess. Archons are okay. But what happens if all of a sudden 10, 12 Broodlords show up with this kind of army to anchor it? If you're not up in the skies, if you're not having some kind of massive amount of Stalkers, good luck fighting that army. Yeah, we got a single, single Dormant Stargate here for Pocket. It is around about time when you got to transition. He is getting a Prism out now. And there's that fleet beacon. So he is starting to transition into Tempest. It's, it's a bit late. Area. It's but a yeah, bit late. I mean, the Greatest right. Fire is going to finish. We, we see Corruptors already coming out. Puck's going to get on that creep. And this is actually a really good time, because for right now, Corruptors don't do anything. So that, that supply of Scarlet is a bit swollen and almost kind of a disingenuous. A lot of it doesn't actually affect yeah. this army right here, except for the Warp Prism. But she's going to go ahead and load up on a bunch of Banelings. And if you look down at her bank, she's got a big gas bank as well. There's the Broodlord, six at a time. Right. If Puck doesn't jump on this right now, he's about to be in a lot of trouble. Absolutely agree with you, but he is up quite a bit in army supply, and a lot of his army is higher tech, has splash damage potential against Scarlet. I don't know. And he's taking his time here, waiting for this high Templar to join in. He does have to go for it, though. He needs yeah. to do this. He's going to go in through that choke. He's pushing forward but right now. The Broodlords are about to finish. Puck can see it right oh. now. Can he storm on top of it? Anything? No. One storm goes to the left. Now there's the storm on top of the Broodlords. They can weather a storm or two, though. They're going to retreat. That second storm oh, is painful. But there's nothing to get there. It's just Immortals now. An Archon or two. That's not going to do it. Scarlet with a massive supply advantage. Yes, she takes a great engagement there. And Puck pulls out. But he, he doesn't have anything here in the air to be able to deal with this just yeah, yet. He's getting look at blinked the production with Stalkers. Tab. He has to get Stalkers there. He's only answer right now. It's his only desperation move. He's lost his Templar. He's lost his Immortals. Uh -oh. There's that last storm for Puck. He's and got 2,000 in the bank. He's got almost 1,000 of gas. Just He just basically fell off on the production. He has missed a few cycles. There's no transition. There's no Stargates. That fleet beacon we saw, it, there's no three or four Stargates behind it to really spend that money. 
Yes, these charge lots will kill a hatchery, but can he stop this army? This is the big question here. It doesn't look like it. This Nexus is going to go down. Oh, and even the Mothership Core sacrificed itself there as well, needlessly. And, and it just, Fox got nothing. Down 60 supply. If you look at that production tab again, he's adding gateways. That's not going to solve this problem. Fifth base is dead, and now the fourth base is in the sights of Scarlet. He doesn't even have Blink. Blink's not finished yet. Yeah, a bunch of Stalkers here that he's trying to keep alive, trying to pick off what he can. And kudos to him for trying and getting the job done, but it is just impossible at this point against Scarlet, who just has way too much. And these Broodlords continue to rain in the skies, taking out more and more free damage here with these Broodlings. This Nexus is not long for this world. No, it's not. It's just holding on because G -G. of fate. GG's called Puck. Is not able to seal the deal there. Scarlet, I mean, you talked about this Maynard. She did a couple of attacks. They really did not go well for her. She pulls back. She's expanding. She had a plan B. Losing that base, but able to kill the army of Puck meant that she bought enough time to get to that tier three. And, and honestly, this is going to be a game that Puck's going to look at and really kick himself over because it's very standard for Protoss to be on top of that, either through the Warp Prism or an Oracle, or just even blind transition to Stargates. That's something that he does every day in like nine of his 10 PVZs that he plays. I mean, it's, it's something that just kind of slipped by him. And again, losing that army and having to resupply it was what kind of brought that on. But even that is an oddity as well. Yes, indeed. And from the ticker, we're seeing some pretty interesting information here on the other side of the uh, stream. I mean, we have community streams going on right now. This is, of course, the main stream that you're watching here on stage here in Montreal. But uh, Petit Drogo already eliminated in stage two of the groups yeah. here. So he won't make it to global finals again. So no repeat performance from him. I think that's one of the most brutal. I mean, we're seeing kind of the, the live feed of what is so brutal about StarCraft. Can you be good at this game? Yes. But can you maintain being good at it at the highest levels for a long period of time? I would tell you it's, it's one of the, the toughest things out there. And that's why actually a, a term that's used for Brood War, Bonjwa, is something that's very, I wouldn't say common, but it's like something that's very well accepted there. It means someone that's dominated over a large period of time. Whereas in StarCraft II, you could even argue we haven't had a true Bonjwa. There's been players that have reached the top. I would think of like an innovation, a beyond, uh, and they won over a, a pretty good span of time, but it was like a month or two. Whereas. I mean, in, in the seven years we've had a uh, top-level professional StarCraft II, we haven't seen that. It's very hard to do. Well, Artosis often says that if there is a Bonjua, there's no question or argument. It just is. Like Flash back in the day, you could not argue that he was the right. best. Uh, just like these days, some people make arguments that innovation isn't the greatest, et cetera, et cetera. But as it stands, StarCraft II, very, very competitive, especially at the upper levels, which we are seeing on stage here at WCS on the other side of the world from Korea. Yep, and that's a heartbreaker, but a good first game in this best of three. And we are underway with game number two here. Puck showed that he has what it takes to kind of navigate the meta, play against a player of the caliber of Scarlet, and get ahead. The question here in game number two is going to be, can he seal the deal and finish it? Because so far, the answer is no. Now let's head to Ascension to Aya for game number two. In the top left here from Root Gaming, this is Puck! And the bottom right from Team Expert. Currently up one in the series. This is Scarlet. Puck, like you said, had a very strong early to mid game there. He had a massive warp in, killed 16 drones with a very minimal investment. Prism was still alive, harassment potential still alive. But then the mid to late game really steamrolled. Once the Broodlords came out, he just had no answer. Yeah, and it really comes down to that attack at that fourth base. It was, uh, you know, he kills the army of Scarlet, he kills the expansion. We saw Scarlet fall behind in supply shortly thereafter. She went for a counterattack that didn't really deal any kind of damage. But the problem was Puck had to spend all of his money not getting to tier three and just kind of replenishing that army and holding on, which was incredible. And, and Broodlords have that ability specifically in the ZVP matchup where if you don't have the right answer, if you don't have Blink, if you don't have Stargates, yeah. You better have something like 20 Archons and 9 Storming Templar. But if you don't have like those kind of crazy things, then you're just dead. I don't care how many unblinkable Stalkers you have. I don't care how many, you know, uh, barding some really bad engagement by Scarlet, which, you know, you can count on not happening. You're gonna die. So Puck learned perhaps a very valuable and, and painful lesson because he knows these things, but to have it executed on the stage is very difficult. We go into another game where you can take a lot of bases. You can defend fairly well. This is also another good map for Protoss. So can Puck learn and, and, and do better? I would absolutely say so. Stark's been very, very good at adapting. 
and uh, fighting back here. He certainly still looks pretty composed on stage. The, uh, I mean, to bring up your point, scouting is so much so important. And the, there was a point, a certain point of the game on game one where Puck just kind of stopped looking at Scarlet. He wasn't yeah. looking for the Hive. He wasn't looking for the Great Aspire. He wasn't sending hallucinated Phoenixes in, observers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, Scarlet got to catch him with his pants down, as it were, with those Broodlords. And it's the same sort of deal, like in Terran. If you see, if see, if you see Ultralisks and you don't have Liberators or Ghosts or whatever, or don't even have the tech for it, then right. that's GG as well. Yeah, it's interesting. It's one of the kind of stresses of the matchup. Oh. Puck was doing a great job of the war person, like you talked about, getting those 16 drones killed and, and doing great harass that way. And that's oftentimes how you kind of keep an eye on the Zerg tech. But, and this is actually a really funny thing with Puck, he ended up going for storm drops and getting a little bit fancy there and replenishing the army. That's not, those aren't bad choices, but the, if you don't replace the scouting that the war person was doing, it becomes a bad choice unless you win off of that. So it was kind of funny because Puck was doing these awesome moves, but those awesome moves were not keeping tabs on what was happening in that main base. And that ended up being a big problem for Puck. Because again, like I said, the last game, Puck was floating about 2,200 minerals, most of that, yeah. about 1,000 gas. It's not a question of could he have made carries or Tempest. It's just that he didn't. And uh, you know, if something would have been like, hey, there's a greater spire here, you bet your butt that uh, Puck would come up with those things. Absolutely. Puck just locking things down on two bases here. Hasn't got that third Nexus just yet. He is getting charged. Got the, uh, he's got Templar Archives obviously made a little bit early here. Robotics Facility still in the way. Look at the and army Scarlet. supply right now, by the way. Yeah, she's been making roaches back at home. As was, uh, yep. Like, she is... is going for the gut, the, the throat here in a yeah. second. She's and this is a tough timing attack because that, that ramp over at the natural, and not even a ramp, excuse me, but like choke area, it's fairly wide open. And it's usually just the one pylon, which is what's getting scouted here. Now, at least this pylon is a little bit further back. It's not part of the wall here oh. for Puck, which would be tough because it's going to be up against Ravage's Corrosive Vial. But it is still going to be extremely hard to yeah. hold. He doesn't have Immortals on the way just yet. He's making more gateways, but this timing from Scarlet could be very, very fatal. Oh, it could. I mean, if that was an Immortal, there's a chance here, but it is going to just be the War Prism. Oh, oh it's not they a get wall. right in there. They're on top of the well, pylon. Well, I mean, that's pretty much curtains already. A depowered wall here, and Scarlet just was way too much. Yeah, jumped on top of that, got the lucky positioning, and Puck is seeing his life in this tournament. Well, it's not over just yet. It's just the first game of the group, but this is so bad. And he's got a couple of the Zergs watching this right now as well, or at least uh, aware of it. And that's it. I mean, the pylon's dead. Puck's got probes doing battle with roaches. That's going to be all she wrote. And this is what makes Scarlet so scary, by the way. She won the macro game, played a brilliant meta game, comes back in game number two and says, nope, I'm going to show you a different look and that's why she's such a dangerous opponent. Yeah, Puck is holding on for dear life, but it is slipping through his fingers right now. He's pulling probes, transferring from base to base, trying to circumnavigate as much damage as possible. But he has, make no mistake, guys, he has lost nearly 30 probes at this point, and Scarlet is not stopping on this attack. It is just going to end this game. Yeah, he's got charge finished, and he's got three gateways up there. That's all fine and good. But Scarlet's just holding down the, pet, the, the gas pedal, if you will. Now nine drones behind this as well, so... You could have looked at it and been like, well, Scarlet doesn't have that many drones either, but now she's going to have close to 40. She's actually winning the fight anyways, so this natural could die, and that's it. GG. Scarlet taking a 2-0 on stage in a very dominant fashion, actually. Game 1 was very close in the early stages. Puck really fighting very, very hard, but Scarlet hitting an extremely powerful timing with Roachling Ravager and just ending it, just bodying him. Yeah, this one got away from Puck, unfortunately. And, and even in this uh, second game, the War Prism, uh, four gateways, he's going to kind of go for a little bit of a flashy thing here as well with zero intel on what Scarlet's doing. That's kind of something that can happen in that matchup, and there's not a lot of options for that. This one got away from that. First game was a great game, a couple of mistakes, and all of a sudden you're behind. If you're behind Scarlet, you're not in a good spot. That's right, and not over for Puck, so Puck fans don't get too upset. Let's go to Mal on stage with our winner, Scarlet. Scarlet, I don't know if you could hear it, but crowds are here and here in full force. The support and the rooting was incredible. Yeah, I could hear the cheering at the start when I got introduced. Um, it's just like WCS Montreal last year. It was a great tournament. The crowd was great. So it's good to see everyone here again. Now, sure, I'll give you guys some time to... There you go, I'm a little weaker, but it's your good nature, good nature. Now, uh, before you got into the game, when I went up to you and just said, hi, good luck, you know, let's do this thing, you did mention that last year it was the same thing. So how sweet was it to repeat what you did in our home country in front of the home crowd? 
Yeah, I was kind of surprised I got to play him again first because he was my first opponent last year here, and I think the series went pretty much the same way as last year. Well, let's just do a couple more questions. In the game one, we all witnessed a drop of Observer. Really, from a pro gamer's perspective, when you're in the middle of the game and something happens, technical difficulty, how annoying is it? How difficult is it to get back into the focus? Um, well, it depends what's happening in the game, but when it takes a long time like that, you can kind of like forget what was happening in the game. Like Puck actually asked me, he was like, what was happening? I forget. So I told him, like, you had two out of my naturally. You just killed my creep tumor. No, I told him oh, okay. what was happening, yeah, so. Yeah, I loved it. Congratulations. It was a great game back and forth, great series, and congratulations advancements. And uh, continue on, streaming through. That's right, Scarlet with a good start here in the group stage number three as she takes out Puck 2-0. Zombie Grub overall, Scarlet looking pretty formidable in those two games. Yeah, she was, but game number one, not exactly what I expected. It was actually very, very long, and uh, there were some points where Puck even looked like he would take it up until about those Broodlords showed up. I uh, heard her say that uh, it was about the same as last year, but I recall that last year I think it was a 3-0 for her, and right, those right. were a lot of early Lingals. So I was like, that's a a little harsh. Game number one here was actually really good and really close. Game number two, though, a very aggressive start there for Scarlet, being able to overcome Puck. Yeah, it's what Jeff said. Like, if you don't really know what's going on, sometimes you try to get a little fancy as brothers. You're like, all right, I'm going to go for this very sharp build, as clean as possible, but then yep. you just die against those sort of early Roach Ravager attacks. There's not much you can do, but game number one was awesome. Really enjoyed it. Yep. Uh, meanwhile, I was watching a little bit of Teal versus Haas. Unfortunately, mm. that just ended. Haas did win the first game in typical Haas fashion. Three <laughs> cannons and then three pilots were left, and he brought over the Mothership Core to overcharge. So he killed two hatcheries in five minutes. I like it. Uh, but in the end, TLO got things together, and he won his first series of, uh, of well, the day as well. Yeah, so good start from TLO to be able to take that 2-1. Haas in a little bit of a trouble now, I suppose. He, Haas is still one of the players that is quite high in terms of the WCS point standings, not quite the top eight by any means. But no, the one way he could make BlizzCon is if he was able to win this tournament. But I don't think anyone really expects a, a, a Haas victory here on, on a WCS circuit stage. Fair to say? Yeah, it's fair to say. I mean, everyone loves watching Haas. Yeah. They love watching Haas. And he can be that guy that no one wants to face. Mm -hmm. Like, no, no, thank you. But that doesn't actually mean he gets very far, you mm -hmm. know? And I'm sure that the start, uh, TLO was a little bit scared. Like, oh, I'm already down 1-0. Yeah. But it's it's kind of what typical, what typically happens with Haas. He might even get, you know, third place here with a close score, but still won't quite make it out. Now with uh, TLO not being in the same group as Neeb, who was basically the gatekeeper to all of TLO's <laughs> dreams and hopes yeah. in the WCS circuit, does that mean TLO just goes on to win the whole thing? <laughs> this is where we're going to see the real potential of Dario. Now, let's just yep. not hope that Dario somehow ends up winning his group and Neeb gets second and they run into uh -oh. each other in the round of 16. <laughs> it's still possible. It's just a little less likely as we do have a minor change to the way that seeding has been done. Mm. Uh, it's at least good to see them not in the same group. It's nice for Dario finally to not go up against Neeb again with tournament life on the line. And uh, yeah, let's see. Dario is going to be an interesting player to follow as well. All right. And speaking of interesting matches to follow, we have next coming up Showtime going up against Probe. And considering what we saw from Probe in Valencia going up against Ni with that 3 2, I think it was in the round yep. of 16. Yep. Yes, correct. Uh, that was a phenomenal showing from Probe uh, going up against our two time WCS champion. So he has a potential shot here against Showtime? Yeah, Showtime versus Probe, actually. I'm pretty excite, so excited for it. Not only will be casting that, but I'm sure have PvP experts on the desk, and it's just <laughs> going to be really awesome hearing that. And, uh, of course, it's going to be really awesome for the Aussie fans. You know, they don't get... Yeah. Uh, sometimes, for a very long time, they didn't get a lot of representation at these events, and now they've been pretty consistent, like two or three every time, and actually getting higher and higher results. Yeah, it's going to be a very fun series. Uh, deciding series already of Group H as well. So if Showtime would be able to win, that is good to see him back where he belongs, which is obviously in the yeah. playoffs, you know, like at two events, one time round of 32, how oh, that happens. And then the second group stage, and we all look at each other like, what is happening? But <laughs> I just really think it was that last map pool, man. That was just a jinx map pool for Showtime. Let's yeah. forget about it. Showtime is back. He's looking good. Pro played well against Neeb, but I do think that series had like a little uh, asterisk on the end where Neeb just kind of seemed to forget what to do against Disruptors and was mm. a little bit stubborn. And as well as Pro played well in that series, I think it's also safe to say that Neeb made a couple of pretty obvious mistakes, which I don't think Showtime is going to make, but a little PvP, I'm ready for it. All right, well, thank you very much as we now head over to a short break. But when we are back, we have Showtime going up against Probe in a PvP here for WCS Montreal. <laughs> 